So welcome, everybody. You're here for the intelligent search session. We have two great speakers. I'm really excited. Does anybody know what this slide is? We could probably recite this all together. So basically, what it says is you've heard a lot of great features that we're going to be releasing in future releases, but we want you to make purchasing decisions based on what's available today in the product. So we're going to plant a lot of seeds in this session. We're hopefully going to answer a lot of questions, but there's going to be follow-up questions you're going to have. So I wanted to make sure for those that you are interested, we've got a group out on our success.salesforce.com called Caveo for Salesforce, and that's where we'll continue the conversation. So our agenda for today, so just introductions, I'm Linda King, uh, I work for Salesforce. I have been here for about five years. One of my key projects was implementing Salesforce with the team uh, on our help and training portal. Hopefully all of you have experienced Caveo even if you didn't know it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we made the decision for Caveo and then we're going to have two great stories. So we have David here from VMware. He's going to talk about how they've implemented Caveo in their partner community. And then Andre Robitaille is going to speak to one year later. Now, some of you might have been in our session last year where we were talking about some of the benefits, but we had really just gone live with our full rollout in September, so we only had about a month. So Andre's going to really be able to now talk about the results that we've seen. So just the big question of why Caveo? I mean, it, and some people go, okay, but what about Salesforce search? I don't understand why would Salesforce actually choose one of our partners from an implementation perspective. So again, as I, first of all, they are an AppExchange partner. And what Andre will share is the fact that, similar to many of you, you have content that maybe sits outside your Salesforce org. Now, in Salesforce's environment, we have many, many, many orgs. And so the Salesforce search today only spans the org that you're in. Since we have assets that are in many, many orgs, we needed to bring in a tool like Caveo to help us gather up all that content where it lives and offer it up to our uh, customers. So it, from a technology architecture perspective, you know, it's a SaaS offering. So it fits within our architecture strategy. We're showing the Gartner slide, and of course, you know, Salesforce, we want to make sure that we're working with partners that have the vision, that are seen in the industry as leaders. And what you'll see both in David's presentation and Andre's presentation, just how Caveo is basically the crawler or the indexer to go find the content where it lives and allow you to use it in a very simple implementation. In fact, I have to say, two years ago, Andre and I were actually sitting at Dreamforce. You know, it was November, and we hadn't signed the contract yet. And I have to say, we were live <coughs> in March. And I didn't believe, some of the guys on the team, I did not believe that we could actually index our content and be live in three months. I've been on a lot of projects, and I've really never had a three-month implementation cycle with a very complex implementation. So the two things that we do focus on within our help and training portal is to be able to increase our internal facing agent uh, proficiency and also our customer engagement. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Great, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, I've been with VMware, and just to start out, how many in here have never heard of VMware, or if you've heard of us, know what we do? Oh, <laughs> you've never heard VMware, okay, great. So that's actually a different answer than I get for most places, because unless you're in IT, which I guess a lot of you are, they don't have a clue as to what VMware does. I've been with VMware almost four years. I'm part of the partner success team at VMware that's part of the Global Partner Operations Group. Okay. And just a background on VMware, uh, we have about 18,000 employees, 50 locations uh, worldwide. Um, we are essentially the fifth largest software company in the world. And for six consecutive years, we've uh, been named to Gartner's Magic Quadrant for x86 infrastructure virtualization. Okay. VMware and Salesforce. Just some background on where we've been with Salesforce and our environment. 
We implemented uh, Salesforce in 2009 for our partner portal. We used Salesforce's PRM application for that. And then by 2011, we had implemented Sales Cloud and Service Cloud. And Service Cloud is something that uh, our partner success team is uh, extremely involved with, with our call centers and case management and things like that. Okay. We have uh, about 75,000 partner accounts. We have over 500,000 active partner users slash contacts in our system. We have seven or so different partner types. Uh, each one of those partner types has different tiers. And we segment our content based on partner type and tier. So when we were going through and looking for a search solution, uh, we had a lot of consideration or a lot of concerns about you know, being able to enforce you know, some of that uh, data modeling. 80% of our revenue is generated through our channel. Okay. So almost all of our large enterprise sales are through the channel. Uh, and we, we heavily, heavily rely on our partners, their training, their certifications, and all of those types of things that they get primarily through uh, our Salesforce portal. We have essentially built all of our portal, including most of our HTML pages, Visual Force pages, et cetera, inside Salesforce. Okay, so this is where our partners go. If you look at our environment, we have uh, home pages. Almost all the home pages look like this, but depending on your partner type and level, you might see different content on this page. Okay. Our main goals are to essentially make it easy for partners to find what they need to find, do what they need to do, get off our site, and go engage with customers. Okay. If they're not engaging with customers, they're probably not selling our product, they're not making themselves revenue, and they're not making us revenue. So a major, major effort in the last couple of years with us is to simplify our site, increase self-service, increase the ability for partners to locate and find what they need to do very, very quickly. We've done analysis such as top task indexing that where we went and asked every partner of every type, when you go to VMware, what's the most important thing that you want to do when you go to VMware.com, to Partner Central, to my VMware, what do you need to do? We took all of those top tasks and we set, essentially put them right in the middle of the page for each partner type. Every partner type had a slightly different list of what was most important for them. A distributor had different priorities than a solution provider. A consulting company had different, different uh, priorities than a training company, okay? So we put those right up. Another thing that we had major issues with, okay, we've got that. What about a really, really good search tool? Okay. And that's when we started looking for something that could uh, provide a great search experience, could work in our environment, and be able to um, satisfy both our internal security and segmentation issues and provide a great user experience, okay? So the number one thing was we didn't want content showing up in a search results page that a user didn't have access to, all right? So if they click on a link and get a access denied or insufficient privileges from your Salesforce error message, okay, that wasn't gonna be a good experience, all right? We wanted to also go in because we have a highly customized environment, both from a UI and also application perspective. It needed to match our branding, our style sheets, and all of those things, okay? So could our search solution fit in with the rest of our site? We needed to be able to tune the system. So we needed both the analytics, and once you had the analytics, we needed to be able to go in and optimize our search engine based on those analytics and what we were learning. Okay. 
a little bit about the project and where we are. We have eight search targets at this time. Seven of them are in Salesforce and one of them is, is external. So our video, our primary video server is BrainShark and that's outside of Salesforce, which is one of the main reasons we had to look for a solution that uh, would work for both inside Salesforce target objects and outside Salesforce. Okay. If you look through here, you know, we have about a thousand English based landing pages, somewhere around 8,000 widgets just for English. We also have Japanese and Chinese localized content in the site. We have millions of documents. We run our entire site on a single org. So that wouldn't have restricted us from using, you know, Salesforce search, but being able to target external uh, sources led us to Caveo, okay? We have at any one time about 13 sandboxes for our development, testing, QA, you know, et cetera, our environment. Okay. What have we seen? We've implemented just a few months ago. And in the few months that we've been running, we've been looking at the analytics and we were extremely surprised at what the top search strings were. They weren't about a product. They weren't about marketing. Our key search strings of being entered was about training. Okay. So we went to the partner readiness team and we said, hey, we're seeing all of these searches as our top searches for our core training. So our VMware sales professional and our VMware technical so solutions professional training courses. Okay. Said, what content do you want to be at the top of the search list when they type in those strings? Because we want to make sure that they're getting the exact right content so they can click on and go and find out about those things because those are two core training courses that every partner has to take to get to their next level to be able to sell our products. Okay. So extremely extremely important for new partners and then other partners that are adding salespeople to their staff. All right. So I went to readiness. They gave me uh, specific PDFs that covered the VSP and the VTSP programs. We went in and wrote a, wrote a rule or two rules actually to put those documents right at the top of the search results. If anybody typed in anything with VSP or VTSP, these are the first documents that are going to show up in our search results. We had almost no click-throughs when we first launched the, uh, the site, okay? Getting very, very few success stories to tell. Immediately after putting those rules in, we started seeing a 65% increase in click-throughs, a 26% increase in relevance, and a 21% increase in click count. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is really the meat of it. How do you provide an easy way for your customers or your partners to find the information that's going to be the most valuable to them? All right, and we're very happy with this. Okay, what are our key lessons learned? One thing, mainly because of our environment and the customization level of our environment, we had to do a proof of concept. And I will tell you that Coveo went above and beyond on doing the proof of concept because when we came and said, oh, by the way, we have solution providers, service providers, training centers, SIPs, you know, you name it, distributors, they can be cross enrolled in those programs. They could just be in one program. They could be at a professional level, an enterprise level, or premier level of those programs. And depending on all of those variables, they might not be able to see certain content on the site. Okay? You need to prove to us that you can support that segmentation and that data model. Okay? And they did. Okay? We absolutely knew that we needed some analytics. And this is the first tool that we have in our system that tells us what a specific user and a specific company and a spe specific company type or partner type is doing in our site with regard to searching for content. Okay, Extremely valuable to us to 
to go in and increase the, the usability, the self-service uh, capabilities of our site. And then we establish, you know, how are we going to measure success? You know, what does success look like to us? You know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, are we tuning the engine and are we seeing results there? But a lot of the other is, are we reducing caseload? Are we reducing the time that it takes to solve a case because now our support desk engineers can go up to our search box, type in a string, and immediately get to content to help the partner rather than having to say, okay, Mr. Partner, you click on this tab and then you go to this link on this page that opens this widget and then you click here and now you've got the document. Okay? Now they can just type in the document name and it pops up and you've got a single click. Okay, so very, very valuable to us. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Andre. Thank you. Thanks, David. You bet. How's it going? Um, my name is Andre Robitaille. I've been here for five years um, with Salesforce. The past two, my team's focus has been on improving our support organization. Um, we started working with Caveo about two years ago. And uh, our main business drivers were trying to improve our customer success, mainly through the portal and through the experience they have with our support agent. It was uh, making it possible to scale with uh, the large growth we're having as a company. Um, so we really focused on making sure that our agent console had all the capabilities to provide answers right away. Every case that comes in, we can read that subject. We can know the categories that it comes with. And we can use that to bias and, and provide back the most relevant content. Likewise, that same feature is available for our customers. If we have content that can answer their questions, they just have to search and they'll get the most relevant. They can filter and get there. Um, we started off with, you can, these are all separate Salesforce orgs. So our, our university lives in its own place. Um, so all the training courses and offerings that people need. Our, our internal org is called 62 org. So our, all of our knowledge and our documentation, our internal procedures, all that kind of stuff. And then um, our community, so answers, ideas, known issues, those kinds of things all lived in completely different places. And recently this year, we started adding in the developer force to give all of our developers a chance and, and YouTube videos we had last year, but we're also incorporating Vidyard um, and trying to get host from any source that Salesforce offers and creates content. We wanna make sure there's like a one-stop shop for our customers to just come in to help in training, type it, and then we'll redirect them anywhere we can. So, the, w the, main, the main driver behind adding these new sources is that we've seen that every new source you add gives more context to the user and, and therefore a better chance for them to self-serve. So we use the analytic insights to understand the true intent. What did they do when they came in? Did they click on things? Did they like that content? Did they dislike it? Did they end up logging a case at the end of that? Um, those kinds of things help us understand and you know, find content gaps and improve those content gaps. Um, over the past year, we, we started this project with a goal of, of improving our self-service um, to 3%. Uh, within the first year, we were well over 11, and um, now we're well over 20. So, I mean, that's pretty dramatic in a year, and we're really happy with that result. Um, our, our average click rank is, has improved by two positions. What that means is that uh, if a customer came to the site and they clicked on the fifth document on the list after searching for something, um, now they would find that same document as the third position on the list. So people are finding it easier, the better content's moving above the folds of the page, and that's making it um, lead to this kind of improvement in our uh, self-service percentage. And then our 30 worst performing queries were actually our most typed uh, search results. So people would type in chatter, and there's just so much content that has chatter, right? So, I mean, they weren't getting the best content. Now we're getting that best content to you. We're get, making sure that people can find that stuff. Um, and our, I think this, this kind of speaks for itself, this slide. You'll, you'll notice the bottom line there is kind of our case volume over the past year. And then you'll see the traffic go up and the new users going up. That's, that's a 30% spike. And each of those points of ingress where you see it spike again, that's when we've added new content. So giving people more content is what's really driving them to, to be able to self-serve and keeping that volume low while our, customers grow, our customer growth goes up. Oh, another thing on that is that the time it takes for them to solve and the time they spend on our site has been going down. So when you see people coming in, in higher volumes but they're not having to spend as much time on the site, they're happier and uh, we're happier that they were able to self-serve. 
What's next is, is what we're really excited about. We're in the middle of redesigning the portal, which should be live in uh, late October. Um, and what we're doing is we're using some, some new functionality that Cabello's come out with to, to provide uh, a machine learning type experience. So everything that you guys are doing on, on our site, we're collecting analytics, custom events that we've set up, and we're understanding what you've clicked on, and, and, and that content is then being boosted through algorithms that Cabello has to make it easy for, for the best content to rise to the top. Um, and as you guys use our site more, it'll continue to get better and better and learn from those kinds of successes. So the old philosophy was always what you see is what you get, right? Um, now th the new one is what you see is what you need now. So what we're giving you is what you need to see. Um, and, and that's the main goal of search is help you find that stuff. So with that, um, I'm gonna open up to some questions. You wanna come? So we've been asked <clears throat> that questions actually be spoken into the mic since this session's being recorded. And that way, um, so anybody have questions? Start back here. So I have to admit, I was initially enticed to come here because the title said, you know, triple your case deflection. That's what really grabbed me. And I just want to get a better understanding what you all have done or what other people in the room have done. What is your calculation of case deflection? Andre, do you want to speak yeah. to that? Yeah, so w when we started this, we had a case deflection of around 3%. So we're getting um, over 60,000 cases uh, a month. And so now we're getting over 20% case deflection. So we're keeping that volume the same. We've increased our customers. So we're seeing deflection um, at a rate of, what is that, 12,000 uh, would-be cases every year that we're not, or every month that we wouldn't get anymore. Well, I think what she's asking is, is some of the key elements that we're counting to calculate the deflection, because that's always the, oh, okay. the dilemma. So maybe just speak to, is that your question? Yeah, maybe just speak to some of the analysis that we did of what are the key behaviors that we're counting as deflection? Um, we're counting things like, did the person, um, at the end of our case flow, we, we provide content, suggested solutions, and when people click on those suggest, suggested solutions, they get to see a preview of the content that should help them, and they can select either, yes, this solved my problem, or no, submit the case. Um, so every time they click, yes, this solved my problem, uh, we close out that case as a case deflected. Um, we, have some, we, have, we have probably 20 different points that we do this at. Um, we do um, a variation of assumptive ratios, so we don't know um, every user's intent in the portal is not necessarily to create a case, but we can assume there's an, um, a, var a variety of needs that they need. So when they come and they view content, when they come and they um, leave our site or they get redirected to the developer force and they don't come back and, and have a session or in the same day they never create a case, we can assume that you know, they've had some success. And we don't take that as a one-to-one -one because we, we don't think that we're that great yet but we do think that there is a, a correlation between people coming with the intent to solve a problem, getting directed to content, and then not logging a case that, that can lead to that. We can have a side conversation if you want to go through everything. Great, and in fact, that might be a good conversation to have you know, even out on our success community, because I bet that there's a lot of good ideas on what people are doing. And I think there's a question up here in the front. And while we're doing questions, so a couple just logistical items. So the deck that we presented is posted on the help, uh, or excuse me, on the resource app, so you should be able to get that. And then I want to make sure um, for those of you that have sat through the session or have any Ryan or GoPro, so I want to make sure I'll be collecting cards while we're going into questions and then right at the end of the session we'll take it off. So, so my, oh sorry. So my question is related to a slide that you had earlier um, talking about like a user search string. They were searching for like um, a chatter, right? And uh, you were experiencing low success because they were using such a generic search string, so they brought up a large volume of content. And then, you know, you talked briefly about how you were able to change that. How did you go about like uh, serving better content even though people were still using very generic search strings? Yeah, there, so there's a variety of approaches we took. Um, some of those things were looking into what did the user search next and finding out patterns, um, trying to see which content they clicked on that, that actually helped them out. Um, we've also introduced um, synonyms that, that, might, that might help them. 
Um, trying, to, trying to weight different things is, is a possibility. We haven't actually weighted much in our search engine because we're trying to do the machine learning and let everyone's activities kind of drive that behavior. Um, but what we've done is those popular terms, we go back to our content that the people were clicking on. And if they weren't having success with that, we look to improve that content. If they um, were having success with the content, though, we try to make sure that that, st that stuff gets shown above the content that they were having less success with. And yeah. It's kind of a continuous improvement. You, you go through it, you analyze it, and it's kind of every, everyone's a little bit different, essentially. Yeah, in our case, almost every document and almost every page starts with VMware. Okay, so VMware this, VMware that, blah, 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 blah. We can go in and actually decrease or almost eliminate VMware as a relevant search string, okay, and then focus on the actual detailed content of the search string. If I can ask one more question uh, about feedback. So what are the different channels that you guys use to capture feedback? Like um, for us, we use, you know, like a scoring mechanism within the article itself. Um, but I have also like worked with other organizations that use like direct surveys. Like uh, when you are navigating away from the support site, you know, it'll pop a survey up and prompt you. How do you go about understanding whether or not users found an article useful? Wait, we actually don't have that right now, but we're in the process of figuring out how we're going to do that. So, so for a lot of our content, we have the thumbs up, the thumbs down. Um, for questions and answers, people give a best answer, so we know that content definitely has the answer to whatever question was asked. Um, and then we also have our case volume. We can see what content the support agent attached to the case, and we know that that ends up solving the customer's problem in the long run. So we look at that content, we, we kind of matrix out all these things and, and see which ones are, are actually benefiting them. We take, so we take the indirect feedback from the cases and the direct feedback from the customers saying this is good or this is bad. Are you getting the results information from Coveo or Covea? Is that what, so they're providing the, the reports and the dashboards and stuff for those results? Yeah, um, Caveo has a really cool analytics engine. So you can you have out of the box functionality, so you don't necessarily need to create custom events. We decided to do so that since we have a heavily customized portal, um, and so we capture a, a variety of different dimensions, and we, we can we can get all that feedback directly from Caveo, and we can view it inside um, Caveo's analytics tool. And we're just now taking our baby steps doing that. Do you have a, like an attribution scheme across those various instances that you were, repositories that you're searching, anything that's consistent across? And if so, where do you, where do, you do that at? Meaning, do we have common attributes across each of our, yeah, so, so when, we go to, when you go to our top results page, um, which is the kind of default search, uh, the, the, the filters on the left side are basically the common attributes we have across. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of different sources and a lot of different teams that want to create and track their own information and they have their own list of values. So part of what we've been doing this year and, and in our new portal is, is we're trying to standardize the list of values. That was one of the big takeaways from last year is that it's not necessarily the search engine of Caveo that you need to optimize, it's your content. Um, getting the right list of values that are standardized across all your repositories, um, making sure that, that you have the dimensions you want to track and that you know what should be biased or what should be available to people to choose and that's going to help them narrow down the results. That's, that's basically um, the kind of key to success in people finding stuff. Um, and, then, and then making those common across all is, it just, I guess it depends on your capability to, to influence your peers in that regard. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're aligning at our top category and topic levels and product names and things like that. And then we're starting to go into role types and uh, user behavior, comprehension level, audience, um, the intent of the article, things like that. So that maybe it's not a filter for the customer, but in the background we can say show on this page things that are for how-to um, videos that are two minutes long, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. The more consistency, the easier it is, and the more fair the weighting of the results would be. So my question was, uh, can Coveo actually connect to different types of sources for search? Because I noticed that both in VMware and in Salesforce, uh, you had large Salesforce rep repositories and probably just one other YouTube or one other one that VMware had. 
So we have multiple different sources, like Knowledge, Wiki, Jira, so can they connect to all of those? Definitely, okay. yeah. Uh, we, that's just a coincidence of, of the way we've set up our organization. Um, we have a lot of other content we'll be bringing in from different places. A lot of those things are on just Heroku databases uh, as well, so we kind of pull them in, and then the reason we go back towards putting them into a Salesforce org is to make it easier for us to standardize and kind of see that stuff and then leverage it with our Wave Analytics product now. All right, great questions. All right, back in, back in the back here. Way in the back. All right, we'll start over here. So we are using the knowledge component. Um, how, how can this help complement the knowledge product. We're trying to standardize all of our content, get it in one place, um, and there are some limitations with the knowledge product. So how can this help to, to complement that and, and provide value for our users? Do you have all your content and knowledge? Uh, we're headed in that direction. We, we went from 12 sites, and I think we're probably down to two or three. Um, so we're slowly decommissioning all of the other sites. But 80% of, of what we have out there is in the knowledge database. Well, right now, currently, our, our knowledge product doesn't give you the same flexibility in terms of SEO that, that you can get when you do use uh, Caveo. So you can, you know, based on the HTML of the file, you can say, you know, if it's a title, give it a higher weighting. If it's bolded, you know, things like that. Uh, proximity of words within the query string to each other in the body. Um, you can use all that kind of stuff in Caveo that'll help you weight, as well as the rules engine, A-B testing, things like that that we, we haven't uh, deployed in knowledge in, in Salesforce. So I think some of those things will help, as well as the analytics and the continuous improvement. Uh, aspects that go into finding content gaps and improving the content that is there. Yeah, I was just going to speak to one other thing that we uh, appreciated was the dynamic faceting, right, in the fact that you're bringing in repositories and some of the faceting and being able to have the facets be reordered, whereas in the standard product, you know, it's a fixed uh, facet, so you want the results that have the most, you know, numbers to show at the top. So that was another key fig feature. Okay. Well, here, well, let me, let me. My question is more about strategy. So we have documentation from the last 20 years sitting out in different databases. The gut reaction of our organization is just to pull all of that into Caveo. I don't want to do that necessarily, but I didn't know what strategy you guys kind of implemented as you pulled things into Caveo um, so that you wouldn't get all that old stuff, or is it actually smart enough to weight it and say, oh, if it's 15 years old, don't even pull it to the top anyways, or don't display this result? Yeah, both. We can basically say, don't pull, because they look at, they can look at all the metadata inside your objects, okay? And you can put, you can put pre-filters on the index, all right? So we can basically say, I don't want you to pull in any, any document that was last modified before 2010. Okay, or we can make sure that in, in a search results, if we happen to pull them in, that none of those show up, you know, they, they might show up as the 3,000th search result, you know, when you're actually doing a, a query. So there are, and I know there are even more advanced techniques and configurations that we can use, but that's kind of the first step that we've done. Do you have any statistics about if it was even worth pulling it in at all? Like, has anyone ever clicked on it? Or is that a, a battle worth fighting, or should you just pull it in and then wait it so low that it, no one ever sees it? You could definitely get those statistics. Um, I, I, like you said, you can wait it um, on the back end. You can have it actually indexed and shown to your customers, but you can, you can definitely get all the content in and not have it, you know, make or muddy your results. But at the same time, um, if you have some kind of intelligent business rules around what you would want people to see or not see, it would probably make sense to index only the stuff that's relevant to your users. For example, we try to bias and weight the things that are within the past three releases so that we can make sure that you guys aren't looking at winter 2012 stuff that's not necessarily applicable anymore. And I will tell you, one of the biggest value adds to having this tool is we're learning all the things that we didn't know about. <laughs> You know, that it is finding, and we're going, wow, we need to get rid of that. Well, I think one 
thing that we experienced, Andre, like we index the community, right? And so there's all sorts of conversation in the community. And one of the first lessons that we learned is, you know, let's just show the ones that are flagged as best answers. So that was just one example where we indexed everything and then we're like, oh my gosh, this is bringing back old, outdated <laughs> comments that aren't relevant anymore. And, you know, we then tailored it just as David mentioned, based on the timing, because in, in our world through releases every year, something that we said or a customer said two years ago is probably not relevant. I wonder if you could comment on the, you know, the people resources and the teams you have to manage the, the content and, and do the analysis to figure out, you know, what's the right content we have, what's missing or things like that. What kind of people, what kind of time are you dedicating to uh, continuous improvement and triage? How many do I need or how many am I getting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we basically have no one that's full time doing it, but Caveo, we typically have some uh, weekly or bi-weekly meetings and kind of look at uh, the metrics and what we're seeing and then getting some coaching on this is what this really means. Uh, and then we have a couple of people that have admin level capabilities to go in and make some operational changes or edits or create rules. Yeah. And what does their role look like? Does it look like a support person or an IT person? Or? It's, it's operations and it's just somebody that has general administrative capabilities of making simple configurations and running reports and understanding dashboards and charts and graphs. It's a very easy tool to use. I can even use it. Yeah, whoever's, whoever's creating your content is probably going to be the same team that would want to see the, the analysis and feedback. I mean, a single BA could probably handle the analysis for a group. We have a few more people now focused on that, driving different initiatives for, with different groups, but that's mainly to make sure that we can have faster progress. Uh, I mean, initially it was just me and you know, my boss and a few and like two other people kind of going through and combing through it with yeah. Linda and, and her team who has knowledge, so. Yeah, like I said, this tool, is, is giving us insight into our users and content usage and you know what they are interested in far more than anything we had before. And we're using it going into Q4 as a roadmap planning for 2016, you know, updates, you know, where, what, can, what, what improvements can we make, what changes can we make, and hopefully actually justify maybe some headcount <laughs> to help with that, so.